Good evening. I am Katie Fang in for Mehdi Hassan. We begin tonight where Mehdi began last night. Ukraine's southeastern port city of Mariupol, where hundreds of thousands of residents were hoping that another attempted ceasefire would actually hold, allowing them to escape Russia's onslaught. Unfortunately, and perhaps predictably, that didn't happen. We should warn you, some of the images you are about to see are graphic, but they depict the realities of war. Ukraine once again accused Russian forces of not only shelling an evacuation route, but also targeting a children's hospital and maternity ward inside of the city. A regional official told Ukrainian media that at least 17 people were injured, including staff and patients. At the moment, we have not confirmed whether anyone died in that strike. But as you can see, children were among the people around the hospital. You can also see how frightened the people are. The attack was widely condemned internationally, with Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky tweeting, people and children are under the wreckage. He called the attack an atrocity. And speaking with Sky News today, he once again urged the international community to impose a no-fly zone over Ukraine. We can't stop alone all this. No, How it's, it's, it it's, it's, it's How is it going to only stop? if uh, the world will unite around Ukraine. Around they are uniting around Ukraine. They are not. They are still. It, it's still very slowly. We are speaking about closing the sky. You can't decide to close or not to close. You can't decide. If you are united against the Nazism and this terror, you have to close. The catastrophe in Mariupol was, in some ways, expected. Remember, this isn't just any city. It is an important economic hub for Ukraine. It also happens to be the last city standing in the way of Russia creating a strategic corridor, one that would bridge the Russian-backed separatist-controlled areas in the Donbass with annexed Crimea in the south. That is why it has seen such heavy bombardment. Here are some satellite images of Mariupol that appear to show extensive damage to the city's infrastructure before and after shelling in the last week. According to Maxar, a company that provides intelligence to the United States government and who took these images, we are seeing buildings and homes, grocery stores and shopping malls, schools, entire neighborhoods destroyed in this battleground city. The Associated Press also reports that city workers have had to create a mass grave to bury the dead, many of them civilians, as morgues begin to overflow. 200,000 people have been trying to flee the besieged town in the last week, but until a ceasefire holds over an evacuation route, that will not be possible. And so for now, the International Red Cross has stepped in, assisting the nearly half a million residents that are trapped without basic resources, including water and electricity, for more than a week. Нет тепла, света, воды, газа, связи, собственно, нет ничего, никаких бытовых условностей. Всю воду собирается с крыши, дождя, родники. То, что есть пока, делитесь между собой. Пока есть, есть гуманитарная помощь в Запорожье, но пока она не может идти. This is why evacuating civilians out of the cities where the conflict is raging is so important right now. And it's also why more than two million residents of Ukraine have already fled the country. Joining me now, we have the Ukrainian member of parliament, Lesia Vasilenko. She is currently on a diplomatic mission to the European Parliament to try and push for more support for Ukraine, including EU membership. Lesia, let me start by asking you right now about Mariupol. What can you tell us about the situation in the city right now? The city is one of the hardest hit cities in Ukraine. It's devastating the damage that they have done. Today, I think all of Ukraine cried with Mariupol as we saw the very disturbing images of a children's hospital being bombed right next to it was actually a maternity ward. And these expectant mothers basically almost in labor, were being carried out by Ukrainian armed forces into safety. We know that uh, in, this, uh, in this devastating attack, there are already casualties. There are many women who were wounded. And the question that all of Ukraine is asking is who would do such a thing and why would they do it to children and expectant mothers? What are those monsters? And 
what have we Ukrainians done to deserve for our children to be born not in safety and in normal conditions, but under uh, missile bombardment and in, into the sounds of sirens? You realize this is like the first thing these babies will hear when they come out of their mother's womb will be the sounds of war, the sounds of bombs and the sounds of sirens. Lesia, I know that you are a member of the Ukrainian parliament, but I also know that you're a mother of three. Um, putting aside the importance of your mission right now to try to get membership for Ukraine into the EU, as a mom, what's your reaction to what you're seeing that's happening in Mariupol and other locations in Ukraine? It's pain. It's such a pain all across the country. And I think this pain is uh, something that the nation is accumulating. It's also something that keeps us going forward. There is no stopping now because we are fighting essentially for our right to exist on this earth. And it's an instinct. It's a basic instinct of survival that is pushing us on and on and that is making the world wonder how is it that this nation is able to counter the utter aggression of the most one of the biggest armies in the world, the second biggest army in the world. So I think that looking over at Ukraine, looking at, over at what people have to endure, we each find inspiration in each other. And as we look onto these cities and as we cry for the dead and for the wounded, we still move on. And we know that we have to go until the end, fighting for Ukraine to come. You heard the clip that we played earlier of your president speaking with Sky News, his continuing call, his plea for help from the international community for a no-fly zone over the country. At the moment, the United States and its NATO allies have ruled out a no-fly zone because it would put them in direct combat with Russia, as NATO has explained. It would have fighter pilots from both sides trying to shoot each other down. That's an escalation that could turn into a much larger war, one with two major nuclear powers. Why is the no-fly zone, though, so crucial? critical for Ukraine at this particular stage in the war? Uh, let me explain what we mean when we say no-fly zone. It's Please. not just the shooting down of, of planes and uh, this mass war between fighter jets in the sky. No. Russia is hitting Ukraine with all it has, with missiles, with rockets. And uh, it's also enough to have forces on the ground able to shoot down all of these uh, bombs which are which are flying and hitting our hospitals, our kindergartens, our schools. It is also necessary to have fighter jets up in the air, which are, yes, able to shoot down all these rockets and missiles and other fighter jets, which are being sent over from Russia and also from the territories of Belarus to Ukraine. But essentially, when we Ukrainians ask and plea for the snow fly zone, yes, it's to protect our children at the protect our civilian population, of course, but it is also to protect the world from that very nuclear disaster that uh, the President Biden and Boris Johnson and all the other world leaders are fearing so much. Because in fact, in Ukraine, we have uh, at least five nuclear uh, uh, objects of uh, extreme hazard. These are five nuclear powers. One of them, which is already under the control of the Russians, is the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant, it's the largest in Europe. If anything happens to them, if any missile or bomb or like piece of shrapnel hits them uh, and causes an explosion, uh, it will be a nuclear catastrophe of the magnitude the world has never seen before. So actually, instead of fearing and guessing whether and if Russia will dare to attack a NATO state with NATO planes or U.S. planes are flying over in Ukraine. It is worse to analyze the risk and have a look at them from a different perspective that Russia, any of these days, may either purposefully or by accident hit one of the nuclear power stations in Ukraine. And then we will be looking at nuclear disaster anyway. Plus, Putin is set on going all the way in. And U.S. generals know this very well. And the answer that we get from them is, uh, uh, what are you going to do about this if there's no stopping Putin and he wants to go all the way and destroy Ukraine as an independent country? Well, it's very surprising, but the generals are saying, 
Well, we don't know. We're just stand and watch. And this is very surprising from a major power like the United States, who always has a strategy and who always knows what to do. Just to sit back and watch like Putin, when Putin is destroying a 44 population, well, I think there is something utterly, completely wrong in that. So, let's see, what's happening right now in Ukraine looks disturbingly a lot like Putin's playbook in Syria. Is there a fear that chemical weapons will be the next thing deployed by the Russians in, for example, heavily populated areas of Ukraine? Uh, we hear reports that Russia is actually launching an informational campaign saying uh, to, uh, to their soldiers to prepare gas masks and to have them on the ready. We also uh, have reports that they are bringing in large uh, quantities of AMIAC into the territory of Ukraine. All of this is evidence that perhaps, yes, they are preparing for an all-in uh, chemical attack and that they would be using the false flag tactic to actually blame it on Ukraine, like they are doing already. They are saying in their propaganda, in their disinformation, they are saying that, oh, look at all these... Uh, all the Ukrainian government, they are killing Ukrainians. But uh, in all of this, what doesn't make sense is why would the Ukrainian government, the Ukrainian armed forces, be bombing hospitals and uh, kindergartens and critical mm. infrastructure? I mean, it will be up to the Ukrainian government again to find the money and to spend the money on restoring all of this. That it's just uh, completely illogical and it's completely mad, like everything that they are doing in the territory of Ukraine. Lesia Vasilenko, we thank you for your time and we wish you luck and please stay safe. The brutality that we are witnessing in Ukraine is unfortunately nothing new for Vladimir Putin. In the Second Chechen War, Putin's first military conflict as Russia's leader, Russian forces leveled Chechnya's capital, Grozny. The destruction was so severe that two years later, the United Nations called the city the most destroyed city on earth. This photo of Russian soldiers planting a flag in the rubble of Grozny would become indicative of Putin's military strategy. Russia implemented similarly brutal measures when it entered Syria in 2015. In fact, a United Nations investigation in 2020 directly accused Russia of war crimes in Syria. Looking at two specific cases, the report concluded, quote, in both incidents, the Russian Air Force did not direct the attacks at a specific military objective, amounting to the war crime of launching indiscriminate attacks in civilian areas. Russia, of course, denied any responsibility. That U.N. report did not look at the rest of Russia's time in Syria, though, like the weeks-long bombing campaign on the city of Aleppo in the fall of 2016, which targeted a medical facility and killed 440 civilians, including 90 children, according to Human Rights Watch. Now it looks like Putin is using similar tactics in Ukraine. Cities like Mariupol have been under intense shelling for days that have destroyed residential areas, medical facilities, and killed civilians. The deputy mayor of Mariupol told The Guardian, quote, it's a war crime and pure genocide. Vladimir Putin means to capture Mariupol, whatever the human cost. Last week, a prosecutor for the International Criminal Court announced that he would open an investigation into the situation in Ukraine. So the ICC, it sits in The Hague in the Netherlands, and it has the jurisdiction to prosecute individuals for genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes, and crimes of aggression. So as we watch Putin continue his brutal invasion of Ukraine, is there an avenue to hold him and others accountable under international law? Joining me now to answer questions like that that is Gregory Gordon. He is a law professor at the Chinese University of Hong Kong. He is also a former war crimes prosecutor with the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda and the United States Department of Justice. Gregory, let's start with one of the most fundamental concepts here. We keep on hearing the phrase war crime being used, but what exactly is the definition of a war crime under international law? You know, I like to make a distinction between war crimes as the popular imagination conceives them, which covers atrocity crimes generally, and the list that you just had there, crimes against humanity, genocide, war crimes, aggression. When the popular um, press talks about <laughs> war crimes, typically it's those. But if you want to talk about war crimes specifically, um, those are violations of Article 8 of the International Criminal Court Statute. And there are generally two categories. Um, there are what we call uh, violations of the law of Geneva and violations of the law of the Hague. Law, violations of the law of Geneva are 
um, crimes that are uh, grave breaches, as they're called, and they're directed at people specifically, so willful killing, torture, things like that. And then um, the Hague law is methods and means. So when you're bombarding civilian neighborhoods, for example, um, and you're not following the, the rules regarding proportionality, right, and there's excessive collateral damage. So you have those general categories, and it looks like right now in Ukraine, all those sorts of crimes are being committed. Well, I mean, neither Russia nor Ukraine are members of the ICC. Um, I'm a former prosecutor, but, you know, if, if they're not even members, how is this going to impact a possible prosecution of Putin and Russia, for example? Well, for, on the, in the Rome statute, so the ICC's statute, which is a treaty, um, there is the possibility for a country to give jurisdiction on an ad hoc basis. Ukraine has done that under Article 12 of the statute. And in fact, in connection with Russian incursions in 2013 and 2014 in Crimea, for example, in eastern Ukraine, uh, there was already a preliminary examination being conducted before this recent invasion of Ukraine. And the prosecutors had concluded that there were grounds to believe that crimes had been committed. Then the invasion occurred. And on top of that, with the existing Article 12 jurisdiction that was there, you have now had uh, over 40 nations join in referring a case to the ICC. And so what was happening before is, has now gone from a preliminary examination to an investigation. And additionally, what is happening right now, all the crimes that you're seeing uh, through the images that we just saw, um, horrible, powerful images, those are now part of the investigation, which the referral by the states has made possible. You yourself, you prosecuted Nazi war criminals. How would you, as a prosecutor, present a case to the court about the commission of war crimes and that situation in Ukraine as being perpetrated by Russia? So there are two aspects that you want to generally look at. First of all, you want to collect evidence of what's happening in terms of, like I said, shelling, uh, the way that uh, civilians are being attacked. Um, and then, additionally, you want to establish the uh, way the criminal modality. So um, it's, it's easy to say, okay, there were crimes committed. Then the, the question is, who committed those crimes? And were they committed by a group of people? If they were committed by a group of people, what was the relationship between the group? Was there a chain of command? And then you want to look at the chain of command and go up. Ideally, you're going to go to the top. The International Criminal Court wants to prosecute those who are most responsible. So you want to establish the connection between the commanders and then the connection to Moscow. And hopefully you go all the way up to Putin. You know, Gregory, I mean, Putin rules with an iron fist. I mean, what are the chances of there not being that direct causal link between Putin giving orders to be able to get things done and the atrocities that we're witnessing that are happening in cities like Mariupol? Yeah, it's easy to look at these images and, and get have a sense of indignation and think, my God, people need to be prosecuted. But as you know, as a prosecutor, when you're prosecuting these cases, the standard is beyond a reasonable doubt. And you have to meticulously chronicle the connection between these people. You do it in various ways. I mean, it could be through witnesses. It could be through documents, um, intercepts. Um, the other thing that's going to be really important here, I think, is all of the social media uh, capturing of images and the capturing of testimony that is going on right now. That will also be, in a way, there's kind of a, a revolution going on in evidence in these cases. And I think this case, I hope it will go to court, will probably be a real testing ground for how social media evidence is used. So I think that whole combination of social media evidence, uh, the relationship between the people who are commanding, uh, the documentation of the shelling and the killing and all the things that you're seeing, that will all be put together and then it will have to be proved beyond a reasonable doubt. You mentioned the existence of evidence like social media videos from TikTok, Twitter, Instagram, for example. Is that as valuable evidence as even the maybe testimonial evidence from prisoners of war or people that are actually former Russian soldiers that are talking about the conduct and the, the acts that they committed when they were in Ukraine? Yeah, I think it's probably not going to be as powerful in court, um, apart from the visceral uh, power of it. Remember, if you go back to the Nuremberg trials, uh, very, there was very powerful evidence of what was happening in the Nazi concentration camps. 
So film, in the, as far back as the Nuremberg trials in the 1940s, was powerful evidence. This will be powerful evidence again, but in many respects, it will be corroborating evidence. So I think what you're going to want to do is have testimony, like you just mentioned. Um, you'll have, uh, I think, probably more concrete evidence. And then the social media evidence will kind of combine with that, and they'll authenticate one another. So I think the combination will be quite powerful. Uh, and that's why I said I think in some ways you'll see a revolution in the way evidence is presented uh, in any trial that comes out of this case. Gregory Gordon, thank you so much for your insight and for being with us this evening. Coming up, Ukrainians warned the Chernobyl nuclear plant was disconnected from the national power grid thanks to Russia. But just how concerned should we be? We'll discuss that next. But first, a moment of reflection amid so much sadness and destruction as the Kyiv Classic Symphony Orchestra performs Beethoven's Ode to Joy and the Ukrainian national anthem in Kyiv's Independence Square. Their conductor called the concert a call for peace. We're back after this. Ukrainian presidential advisor is calling the situation in Chernobyl a, quote, extremely dangerous situation. The infamous nuclear power plant there has been disconnected from Ukraine's power grid, critically jeopardizing the cooling of nuclear material still stored at the site. A United States official tells NBC News they don't think the power being out at Chernobyl poses a radiation safety risk. Still, the plant's backup generators reportedly only have capacity to power Chernobyl for another 48 hours. It's why Ukraine is demanding a ceasefire with Russia to allow repairs to the facility. The situation at Chernobyl and other nuclear plants in Ukraine carry grave risks. Take a listen to what the Ukrainian ambassador to the United Nations said earlier this week. Much of the environment, environmental damage inflicted on Ukraine by the Russian invasion will likely prove irreparable in the in near future. The Chernobyl disaster of 1986 teaches us that the effects of nuclear accidents endure for hundreds and, and even thousands of years. Ukraine is heavily dependent on nuclear power plants. The country gets over half of its energy from them. After the fall of the Soviet Union, Ukraine was in possession of the world's third largest nuclear arsenal in the world. In the Budapest Memorandum of 1994, it handed over that arsenal in exchange for a promise to not be the subject of a foreign invasion, a treaty which Russia first broke when they invaded Crimea in 2014. The power plants that built those weapons now supply nuclear energy instead. The country has 15 operable nuclear reactors located at four plants on top of four other decommissioned reactors at Chernobyl. Russian forces have already taken control of Chernobyl and a nuclear power plant in southern Ukraine, which is the largest plant in all of Europe. Joining us now to understand this better is Monica Montgomery. She is a research analyst at the Center for Arms and Control and Nonproliferation. Monica, thank you for being here. We've got lots of questions. Data transmissions from Chernobyl providing information about the status of safeguard monitoring systems have reportedly been cut off now as a result of the power supply having been cut off. Should we in the United States be concerned about the status of Chernobyl all the way over um, in Ukraine? So I want to emphasize that there is no immediate risk to civilians in Ukraine or here in America. Uh, yes, the power has been cut off to Chernobyl, but as you spoke, there is a backup reactor or backup, excuse me, a generator supplying power in the immediate moment to Chernobyl. There are some serious concerns, though, if this uh, situation is not resolved. As you spoke about, Ukraine has four active nuclear power plants uh, with a, a number of active reactors. There's also the decommissioned Chernobyl nuclear site, which has a number of spent nuclear fuel and radioactive waste that must be kept safe and secure. The bottom line is that nuclear uh, reactors and nuclear waste and materials were not built for a war zone. 
when during a war, when there is there are missiles or shelling um, around a nuclear power plant, there is the risk that the nuclear power plants themselves could be damaged, or in the case of Chernobyl, that the electric power grid that it, that actually powers these plants and keeps these materials safe is cut off. While nuclear energy provides power to the electricity grid, it also depends on it to keep the materials safe and secure. Why we're in this immediate, uh, while we're in this moment of concern, it's important to emphasize that there are a number of backup uh, measures to prevent radiation from being released. So without going into detail, right now, Americans, Ukrainians, the world is not at risk of radiation exposure. However, power must be restored. These, these power plants must not be subject to further shelling and operations um, must continue safely and orderly to ensure that a, a radiation accident doesn't happen. Monica, you talk about safe and orderly operations of nuclear power plants. I don't think it's too far of a stretch to make an assumption that the Russian soldiers that are taking over um, these power plants, if they're doing it in lieu of or in substitution of the people that have actually been running and operating these power plants, that doesn't leave me with any good feeling of confidence that they're going to be able to competently get this done. Absolutely not. But the good thing is, or not a good thing, but we, we are thus far believing that it as it is the original nuclear power plant operators and workers at Chernobyl that are still working there. However, they're under serious duress and conditions. Those at Chernobyl have been working for 13 days straight. Um, and those at the Zaporizhia plant, which Russia took control over after shelling on it a few days ago, are supposedly uh, being held hostage by Russian soldiers and being told to work at gunpoint. Those coming in and out of the plant, whether they're emergency services or other nuclear power plant operators themselves, are having to travel through a war zone to get there. So the situation is obviously extremely concerning and these um, these these workers need to be allowed um, rest they need to be allowed to work under safe and secure co conditions not under duress and it's also important that we can get outside inspectors from the international Atomic Energy Agency, uh, the watchdog for energy to go in and ensure that these pl plants are operating orderly and that these uh, workers are, are getting the conditions they need to ensure the safety of the power plants. You know, Monica, Ukraine relies on these nuclear power plants to power the country. All images we're seeing, it's cold, it's snowing, it's freezing in Ukraine right now. How much of the fact that uh, these power plants are now trying to be a part of Putin's control, how much do you think that's factoring into Putin's overall military strategy in terms of trying to take over and invade Ukraine? So one thing to emphasize is that we don't know if the initial shelling on the Zaporizhia plant or the, the cutting off of power to Chernobyl were intentional acts. Regardless, they're extremely reckless that Russia is even um, conducting combat operations around electrical plant grids and around nuclear power plants. But Russia can cut off the power. Cutting off electricity is not a new tactic in war. And Putin has shown his willingness to bring civilians in harm's way in this conflict. So cutting off the power, um, whether that is gaining control of the nuclear power plants and controlling the power that those plants send back to the energy grid, or cutting off the energy grid in entirely, is a serious concern both for the humanitarian impacts um, in the country right now, but also for the larger consequences that would come if power is not restored to the active nuclear power plants or to the spent fuel pools that keep the radioactive waste cool and, um, and, and prevent them from uh, releasing into the atmosphere. Yeah, you talk about those cooling systems. A Ukrainian National Emergency Services Agency announced today that if power is not returned to Chernobyl's cooling systems, it could create, quote, a radioactive cloud that could blow over Ukraine, Belarus, Russia, and Europe. Um, is that hyperbole, in your opinion, Monica, or is there an immediate safety issue for the people in the areas that are surrounding these nuclear facilities? So there is no immediate safety issues. Chernobyl is running right now on a backup generator, but yes, there's likely only fuel to run this diesel uh, generator for 48 hours. However, the spent fuel at Chernobyl is over 20 years old, which means that we're talking about a matter of days, not hours, that radiation, radiation could release into the atmosphere if there is truly a complete meltdown there. 
Um, it is a concern, though, and it's something that necessitates the need, uh, the pressure on Russia right now to restore power to Chernobyl. If, if that's not possible, to, to bring in more fuel to power um, the generators, to bring in more water to cover the fuel rods um, that are boiling down water that could lead to radioactive release, and to allow international inspectors in to control these situations. So there's no immediate risk, but if if all the bad things did go wrong in the long term. We can't um, predict necessarily what would happen, but there could be dire consequences, not just in the local proximity, but over the globe if radiation is released. Well, Monica Montgomery, we thank you for all of the information, and we pray that that perfect storm of conditions doesn't occur. Thanks again. Winston Churchill coined the term, quote, Iron Curtain in 1946. It was a reference to the political and ideological split in Europe between the Western bloc of U.S. allies and the Soviet Union. Well, now it seems we're watching yet another Iron Curtain split the continent. NATO and its allies have shut Russia out of its airspace and have imposed strict economic sanctions to isolate Russia's economy. It's not just other nations, though, that are moving to make Russia a pariah. In sports, FIFA indefinitely suspended Russia from competition, and the International Olympic Committee has urged sports bodies to exclude Russia's athletes and officials from international events. Companies have also pulled out of Russia in response to its invasion. Tech giants like Google and Apple have stopped sales. Credit card companies like MasterCard and Visa have cut business ties. Even McDonald's has stopped serving burgers in Russia. The Golden Arches were a symbol of the Iron Curtain lifting when it set up a restaurant in Moscow in 1990. Well, now they're temporarily closing its 850 Russian locations while still paying those employees. But Putin and the Kremlin have taken their own actions to insulate Russians from non-state approved information. They have pushed out Russia's independent broadcast media, and they have banned Facebook and restricted Twitter for tens of millions of users within the country. And last week, Russia passed a new law about spreading fake news about the military. It's punishable by up to 15 years in prison. The government's crackdown, coupled with the impact of economic sanctions, has convinced some to leave the country. But there are others in Russia who continue to bravely speak out against the invasion. So far, Russian police have arrested thousands of protesters throughout the country. However, there are those who are galvanized, and they are openly supporting Putin's invasion. Pro-Putin Russians have adopted the letter Z as a symbol of support for Putin and his invasion of Ukraine. Over the past few weeks, it has appeared on billboards in Russia, T-shirts, and even on the uniform of a Russian gymnast who took the podium next to the gold medal winner from Ukraine. Joining me now to break this down is Nina Kuscheva, professor of international affairs at the New School. Nina, so grateful for you to be here. Would you yourself Thank classify you. what's happening now in Russia as a new kind of Iron Curtain? Oh, absolutely, it is. And it's uh, an Iron Curtain uh, comparing to the original one when it was the two ideologies were fighting each other. Uh, and therefore, there was an Iron Curtain, and the Soviet Union was um, uh, in, even willingly and voluntarily left itself, uh, kind of separated itself from, from the world. In fact, it was Stalin's idea to have communism as one in one separately taken country, so we don't need the world. Now it seems that Putin wanted to invade Ukraine, but also didn't want to, the world to respond to this. And that's this kind of an interesting conundrum, uh, interesting conundrum there. I see that you're showing those horrible images of the Soviet flag um, hanging on the tanks. So that's kind of coming back to uh, what the old world used to be. So now, but I know, I think the Iron Curtain today is a much more horrifying proposition because at the time there was no non-Iron Curtain for first Russia and then the Soviet Union. So it was it was always somewhat enclosed from, uh, from Europe, from the world. Uh, but now, after 30 years of openness, after 30 years of Russians being cosmopolitans and global citizens, voluntarily Putin decided he'd just put an end to it and uh, deprive of life that they know all 140, uh, 45 million of Russians today. 
Nina, we've heard different theories about why Putin has invaded Ukraine, running the gamut from obviously some of the ones that say he doesn't want NATO, Ukrainian membership in NATO, et cetera. You wrote a piece in the Globe and Mail recently that I, there was a, there's a quote from it I wanted to read to you and get your thoughts on it. You said, Mr. Putin has long indicated a desire to restore the Orthodox Christian Kingdom of Rus, the basis of Russian civilization, by building a Russian union encompassing Russia, Ukraine, Belarus, and the ethnic Russian areas of Kazakhstan. Kazakhstan. Is that what you think is happening here? Is this a new Russian empire that Putin is attempting to build on the backs of Ukrainians and others? Well, it's, I think at this point, there's so many things go into what he, I think, wants to do. So that would be even that kind of complicated thought that I had, uh, or at least try to write in that article, uh, would be probably too simplistic because mm. Putin has been, right from the beginning, he was saying that uh, you know, we are the, um, the the historical Russia, and that's why the Soviet Union. Although he did say that he uh, that it was a geopolitical uh, catastrophe that it broke, uh, that it broke. Actually, he's really not that big of a fan of the Soviet Union. He's a fan of Great Russia. He's always been a fan of Great Russia. But although I, I think that usually people make a mistake thinking that he want he wants to recreate the Soviet Union. I think he wants to create his own kind of whatever that that conglomeration of of, of uh, lands he wants the gather of lands as all the greats that came before him so he wants to be putin the first he wants to be putin the great and ukraine certainly as uh, always an appendage of russia to some degree was called small russia navarossia uh, sorry uh, malarossia early on uh, somehow of course has to fit into that pan-Slavic national uh, desire, national agenda. But I think at this point, oh, all this onslaught is more than that, because Putin doesn't want to look as a loser. And therefore, it mm. seems to me that he's willing to take down the world with him only to prove that um, he does have the muscle and he's just going to use it. Well, Nina, you've been a student of the history of Vladimir Putin. You've written books. You've studied the history of him. Is he still a rational actor? There are some people that are opining that perhaps he's not. Do you think that he would ever find a rational off-ramp for the aggression and the atrocities that he's committing in Ukraine right now? Well, until February 24th, uh, 22nd, when all these decisions were made, I thought he was, he was an autocrat, he was an authoritarian, but he certainly has political understanding of the world. So he has the national interests in, in mind, so to speak. Clearly, on February 24th, uh, my theory was badly broken. And I do think it does appear to me, I mean, we don't know, but it does appear to me he acts like a typical dictator. And as a typical dictator, of course, what is rational for a typical dictator? Dictators mm -hmm. make decisions based on the worldview, the geopolitics they have in their mind nor that they have in, in reality. We don't even know whether he's seeing the images that you're showing now. I'm sure he's told that things are going, it's hunky-dory and all, all wonderful and, and dandy uh, in Ukraine, and it's just going to be ending tomorrow morning. So we don't, because in dictatorial mind, and that's what I've studied for a long time, that kind of idea of rationality is not the same as we understand his rationality. However, in this sense, every dictator is crazy. But at the same time, it doesn't mean in this kind of straitjacket, crazy madman that we usually say when we, t when we talk about, about mad, mad people. Nina, I don't have a lot of time with you, but I wanted to ask a, a question of you. You know, even from Stalinist Russia, the mistreatment and the killings of Ukrainians, that's a part of the Russian history. Um, but we're in the 21st century, right? So do you expect a lot of Russians that will voluntarily leave the country in light of the treatment of their brothers, their sisters, their, their kin that are Ukrainians? Well, I do want to say that Stalin kind of killed indiscriminately. I mean, he killed Ukrainians, he killed Georgians, his own True. people, he killed Russians, True. he killed everybody. But yes, and then I think that is, I mean, talking about a giant brain drain, talking about the complete depletion of, of the greatest journalists, the greatest minds. I mean, I was hearing from my friends, uh, Memorial, the Human Rights Organization, a very good friend of mine, Irina, um, Irina Shibakova, she's now in Tel Aviv. 
uh, or maybe I shouldn't have said that, uh, people go to Georgia, people go to Kyrgyzstan. I mean, nobody before would immigrate to Kyrgyzstan. It's a Central Asian Republic. It's, uh, you know, comparing to Russia before it used to be rather, uh, rather repressive. And yet people immigrate there because for them, being there is better than being in that kind of pan-Slavic empire of the Middle Ages that Putin seems to be wanting to recreate. Nina Kosheva, thank you so much for your insight and for being here. We appreciate it. Thank you. Up next, we're going to take you to Lviv, Ukraine, where tens of thousands of refugees are desperately trying to find passage on their way out of the country of Ukraine. We're back after this quick break. Just west of where the horrors of war are hitting the hardest is the Ukrainian city of Lviv, which has so far escaped the brunt of Russian aggression. The city has become somewhat of a staging block, both for refugees fleeing the war and for foreign fighters that are reporting for duty. It's also where we find NBC News correspondent Cal Perry. Cal, we're so grateful, A, that you're safe, um, and B, that you're able to tell us what you're seeing and you're hearing from the people in Lviv right now. So can you share with us um, what's going on over there? Well, as you sort of laid out, you have hundreds of thousands of people who have now sort of bedded down in this city. The city had a population of 700,000 before the war, and now you have close to a million people here. The mayor saying that the city really can't take any more, and so people are trying to be shuttled uh, to Poland, but that border is being overwhelmed as well. And then tonight, in just the past six hours, you have this word of two nuclear sites, Chernobyl and the Zaporizhia power plant. Our viewers will probably remember Zaporizhia last week was that site where there was that heavy firefight. Um, both of those plants have been sort of taken off the IAEA's monitoring system. So while there's no sign that there's damage or that there is a danger, it is worrying news for people here in the west of the country who may be trying to stay. I think you're going to see a lot more people just make that choice that they want to leave because there's so much uncertainty going on about how wide this war will get, Katie. Yeah, but Cal, where are they going to go? So they've, they've, flog, they've flocked to Lviv. Um, they're trying to get out. When we spoke a couple of nights ago, um, supplies are running low. The train stations are overwhelmed. What are their options now? What's left? Yeah, your question is exactly the one that people are asking themselves here. There's two ways to get out of western Ukraine where I am. You can go to Poland 50 miles away, but you could sit there for two days. You might have to abandon your car. You might have to walk across. If you have children, that may not be an option. That's no good. You can go to Hungary. The problem is you're driving further into sort of Ukraine. You're, you're, you're taking a chance that you could come across violence, that there could be uh, something that happens on the route. So it's an impossible choice. And the folks who are ending up here have come from places where uh, officials are describing it as hell on earth. They're coming from places like Kharkiv, where their houses were destroyed, where they lost people in front of their eyes. Or they're coming from, you know, the suburbs of the capital, where there are actually Russian soldiers now physically forcing people to flee. And you get here, and it's really a difficult situation for all of the reasons you laid out. There's really nowhere to go unless you're willing to make that commitment of walking for miles or, or leaving your things behind or making that impossible choice, Katie. What about some of the neighboring countries other than Poland? Have we been hearing that they are opening up their borders to be able to take more refugees from Ukraine? Yes, Hungary is one of those countries. They haven't taken a lot of refugees. More than half have already gone to Poland, but it is one of those places. Moldova is another one where the United Nations High Committee on Refugees, UNHCR, has a camp set up outside. Um, but again, you know, there are politics here at play. And, um, you know, the European Union um, doesn't necessarily want a flood of refugees. Poland has dried, tried to drop the entry requirements for Ukrainians. They've dropped a visa requirement. They've dropped a COVID testing requirement. You didn't have to have a test right now to cross into uh, Poland. You could still have to quarantine, but it's at least a way out. Some of those other countries are not dropping those requirements, um, and so it is a very difficult situation. The other thing is, as the situation gets worse, it's only going to get worse at these borders. I mean, these borders are inevitably going to get jammed up to the point where you mm -hmm. can no longer pass in between. And one further thing, sorry, on the Polish side of the border, you have people waiting to get to Ukraine to come and fight the Russians or to get their family out. So both sides of the border are completely jammed up. Wait, wait. So we're getting a we're getting kind of a, a log jam of people on the Polish border for even fighters that are trying to get into Ukraine to be able to assist in the war. 
Yeah, so according to officials, it's a combination of folks who are trying to come here to evacuate their families. Maybe they're coming to Lviv to take their families back out, families that just can't physically get to the border. And it's backed up with people who are returning either to this country to fight or, as you've laid out, foreign fighters. The other thing that's happening um, is the train is still running from Poland. So you have foreign fighters, you have journalists, you have some civilians coming from Poland on the train into the central Lviv train station. The problem is once you get to the central Lviv train station, you're kind of stuck there. It's become basically an outdoor refugee camp. But those train lines, at least for now, are still moving. Very quickly, Cal, I only have maybe about 30 seconds with you. Are the conditions deteriorating in Lviv? When we spoke a couple of nights ago, you talked about there's no room, there's no supplies. Is it getting a little bit more chaotic there? So housing is the first thing to go. There's no more housing. Food is the thing that's going next. Restaurants are starting to shut down because they just don't have food. Yesterday was an ominous sign. It was the first day we lost power for a couple hours. That's the kind mm. of thing where people will just flee. If we lose power here, it is freezing cold outside. That would force a lot of people out. NBC's Cal Perry in Lviv. Please stay safe, um, and thank you for being here tonight. When we return, I will talk to the president and the CEO of UNICEF USA about the impact on some of our most vulnerable refugees from Ukraine, the women and the children, after this quick break. It is being called the worst refugee crisis in Europe since World War II. The United States ambassador to the United Nations says at least 100 Ukrainian refugees are crossing into Poland every minute, 100 every minute. So far, nearly 2.2 million refugees have escaped Ukraine. About half of them are children, according to UNICEF. Today, Reuters reported that more than 40,000 women and children were evacuated from Ukraine. However, it is becoming increasingly difficult to get people out of the conflict zones into the bigger cities like Kyiv, Kharkiv, and Mariupol. And those areas are where things are getting increasingly dire. As we reported earlier, Ukraine says a Russian airstrike destroyed a children's hospital today in Mariupol. 17 people were wounded, including mothers in a maternity ward. The United Nations Human Rights Office says that at least 474 civilians, including 29 children, have been killed in Ukraine since Russia invaded two weeks ago. While men are prohibited from leaving the country because they have to stay and help fight, many women and children are doing anything it takes to leave the only country that they have ever called home. They're leaving by bus, by train, on foot, each of them forced to make incredibly difficult decisions. One of them being, what do they bring with them? What do you leave behind? Our friend Cal Perry, who just reported live from Lviv, he spoke with the families and the kids in Lviv about that very dilemma. Newly minted reporter, nine-year-old Eve, helps me interview her six-year-old brother, Mehran. For them, fleeing meant securing their stuffed animals. My name is Matt V quickly arrives on the scene and presents Hank. This is his favorite. He's had it since he was born. It's his bed buddy every night. Little Emma then announces her presence. Her sister relays the sad news. She was getting dressed too slowly, so she didn't have time to pack her toys, we're told. Dad, Yafan, brought a bag of what he thought was vital, paperwork and clothes, as well as his five children, his wife, his sister, and her mother. As many kids' clothes as can be stuffed into a bag seems to be the overwhelming and the consistent necessity of parents everywhere across this war. Though every parent can relate to this, room for a child's drawing. The heaviest things, the emotional baggage, comes no matter what is physically carried. Uncle Nikolai tells us it's fear, it's stress and uncertainty that he carries, but he finishes with hope, a hope that he says one day they'll all be able to return home. That was NBC News correspondent Cal Perry for us in Lviv, Ukraine. Joining me now, though, to talk more about this humanitarian crisis is Michael J. Neinheis. He is the president and CEO of UNICEF USA. Michael, let's begin with the attack that happened today on the Children's Hospital and Maternity Ward in Mariupol. UNICEF is calling again for a ceasefire. Here's part of a statement from UNICEF's executive director. Attacks against civilians and civilian infrastructure, including hospitals, water and sanitation systems and schools, are unconscionable and must stop immediately. Do you really have some optimism that a ceasefire is going to happen? And if not, what are the next steps for these refugees? 
Well, listen, our hearts are breaking for um, the, the mothers and the children, the families of those at that hospital, but not just there, elsewhere across the country, and not just there, but uh, crossing the border into places like Poland. Um, you know, children are um, at, at the heart of this in terms of uh, the impact, uh, the trauma that they're experiencing, um, the, the, the breaking of their, of their patterns and their habits and their stability, the being out of school, being out of their neighborhoods, not being able to take uh, uh, their, their precious things with them that, that give them a sense of stability in life is just heartbreaking. And we do need this to stop. Um, if you just look at the impact, not only now, uh, but in the future on these kids, uh, this is just has to stop. Women and children are particularly vulnerable. And as we mentioned, expectant mothers were injured in that hospital attack today in Mariupol. What are aid organizations doing to help expectant mothers specifically? Well, we have uh, we organized a, a major relief shipment of uh, critical medicines and medical supplies, uh, 62 tons of materials that we trucked in that made it to Kiev and or, yeah, to Kiev and to Kharkiv as well, uh, to hospitals, about 50 different hospitals, getting the critical supplies that are needed there. Uh, that's what we need to do is to make sure they have access to healthcare while they're there. Um, and, and, and we're seeing that happen uh, you know, in the hospitals that we're able to work with, but things are getting more and more difficult. Uh, we're going to have to find options for more and more of those people to, uh, to get out uh, and get to other places where they can get some uh, peace and some stability and some care. One thing that caught my eye today, Michael, was UNICEF's write-up about unaccompanied and separated children that are fleeing Ukraine all by themselves. Your website reads, for children who have been displaced across borders without their families, temporary foster or other community-based care through a government system offers critical protection. I'm sorry, I'm getting a little choked up. I have a seven-year-old daughter. Mm -hmm. Can you share with us about this massive undertaking? These are children that are fleeing alone. They are unaccompanied. Are there any plans to work on family reunification later on for these children? This is a core part of our work in, in refugee settings like this. Um, we have established uh, along the Ukrainian border 26 what we call blue dot centers. These are places, uh, service centers that are easily identifiable. Uh, UNICEF is a well-known name and brand there. People feel comfortable coming to us. Among the things that we do there is register children both those with parents and those who are unaccompanied, uh, to keep track of them, uh, to, to, to work on reunification uh, with parents, to uh, create a clearinghouse, uh, to make sure we can get kids back with their families. Uh, so this is a real problem, not just in this crisis. We see this all over the world all the time, and it's while child protection is such an important part of UNICEF's mission. But that's got to be a logistical nightmare, right, Michael? I mean, how do you keep track? I mean, what are the actual logistics, the practical means by which you're keeping track of, for example, the unaccompanied minors that are fleeing Ukraine right now? Well, and again, that is being present. That's really important, obviously, in places, uh, border crossings where, where, um, where people, uh, young people either uh, unaccompanied or with their parents are coming uh, to provide a safe place where they feel comfortable to come for services. These blue dot centers that we, that we operate provide mental health and psychosocial support. They provide um, uh, direction to other types of services, shelter, food, transportation that people need. Um, and so uh, collecting people there and uh, making sure that we do the registration that we know how to do uh, so that people, uh, parents who are looking for their kids know where to come uh, to, to, to look for them. So uh, again, it's such an important piece of what we, uh, uh, part of our work and, and a critical priority for us. Michael, there are so many of us here in the United States that are sitting in the privilege and the luxury of the safety of our homes right now. We have food. We're not at fear of being at harm or death. Um, for those of us that want to help, what can we do? Well, I'm at home, too. Uh, you can maybe see in my background here. I'm at home in my safe place in Connecticut. Um, you know, my heart goes out to every single one of those people who had to leave their homes, had their homes destroyed. Uh, we need to help them. And the best way we can help is to support the courageous, daring, resilient, uh, relentless workers uh, at UNICEF and at other places as well uh, that are the aid workers that are there supporting them. Uh, we need resources to do that. Um, our uh, regional office there has put out a $350 million appeal uh, to support the work we're doing and getting critical supplies there, uh, doing mobile medical teams, mobile mental health teams, these blue dot centers, 
all of that work. And we need people to support that for us. And they can go to our website, unicefusa.org slash help Ukraine and help Ukraine. Michael Neinheis, UNICEF USA president and CEO. Thank you. That does it for me tonight. Mehdi will be back here tomorrow night at seven right here on The Choice from MSNBC. For now, good night. Hi, I'm Mehdi Hassan. Thanks for checking out our channel on YouTube. You can see more of the Mehdi Hassan show by clicking on any of the videos on this screen and make sure you subscribe below to stay up to date on the day's biggest stories. Thank you for watching.